Hello and welcome to History Respond. I'm your host, John Harney. Uh, for this episode, we're going to look at CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk 2077. And I'm really excited about our guest for this episode. Our guest is Professor Andre Sorensen from the Department of Human Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. His writings include The Making of Urban Japan, Cities and Planning from Edo to the 21st Century. And I'm really excited to talk to Dr. Sorensen about, well, Night City, which is a setting that um, CD Projekt Red seem, seem to have put a lot of time into and seem quite proud of. Uh, Dr. Sorensen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's actually been fun to, to look around night, to explore Night City. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, that's part of the reason we had you on, you know, because in many ways I was thinking, you know, the more I played the game, the more I thought, you know, this, they've, what they've tried to build with the city is fascinating to me. And I'd love to talk to somebody who, you know, understands cities more than I do in, in a more structural and kind of researched way. So, so yeah, tell me, tell me what you think from, you know, and I should point out, I sent, uh, I sent Dr. Sorensen some footage. So you're guilty of watching what I selected for you, I suppose. But uh, what did you think of Night City from what you've seen? Well, of course, I guess the first thing is, uh, as someone who doesn't play a lot of uh, online uh, games, or at least the, the immersive ones where you're in a 3D environment, I was amazed by the the detail of the city. I mean, it's, wow, it's, it's actually very persuasive in some ways. Mm -hmm. There's so much information coming at you about being in that place and touring around and the billboards and, yeah. the, and the, the garbage on the sides of the sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's convincing in many ways. Uh, I guess what, what I found both intriguing and, and kind of disappointing in some ways is, is the stereotypical portrayal of this urban dystopia uh, as the high rise, well, of course it's always nighttime, is the Blade mm -hmm. Runner vision of the future of urbanism. Right. Uh, of uh, really, uh, almost exactly. I mean, it really is that view. It's like all the, the wet pavements. Right. And the, the uh, Asian food courts, you know, where what's his name gets the noodles. Yeah. <laughs> Blade Runner. But also the, the gas flares, you know, like you're right. going, driving along the city, the street, and there's this sort of flare of gas, which is really common in a lot of film depictions of the future terrible place, the terrible right. city, which is also kind of wildly weirdly unrealistic like why would you have <laughs> gas flares i mean i guess in los angeles it's in the middle of a huge oil field and there actually was you know oil production going on all around the city at a certain mm -hmm. point but uh so that that was that was intriguing but of course what one thing in reflecting on this as a as a depiction of a dystopia I mean, there's a lot of really interesting um, aspects of, of that, that portrayal. And of course, you know, the dystopia uh, is, has a long tradition, uh, both in, in Japan, thinking about, you know, the, the, the bad future that could happen. But, right. uh, but it's really a, the, the depiction of a dis urban dystopia is also particularly American. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it's that it's the inner city. It's the high, super high density, high rise place that's kind of lawless and crime ridden, decaying, crumbling mm -hmm. infrastructure, uh, garbage, uh, shuttered businesses, you know, the endless industrial park with nobody on the streets, abandoned land. I mean, that's a very American idea that goes back to really the 19th century fears of mm -hmm. cities, city as the great corrupter of morals, of community, the loss of community that cities represented. You know, the, the Chicago School of Sociology, an anomie, it, it's mm -hmm. about rural, healthy, 
upstanding young people moving to the city and getting corrupted. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know? So, and then, so, I mean, that dystopian vision of the high density, gritty, polluted place then sort of gets overlaid with this weird Japanese visuals and or architecture and uh, multi, you know, the, 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 the expressways every, looping right. everywhere. I mean, that's really the, a dominant visual architectural planning aspect of, of Night City is the expressways looping everywhere. Yes. <laughs> at all levels. Yeah, it reminds me of, you know, uh, so I, I'm, I'm Irish originally and Irish cities are very different from American cities. And I lived in Texas for a while. And so I wasn't ready for these, you know, these 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 interstates in these highways. And as my father would always say, this this is a terrible off ramp because you've got to turn right to go left. And neither he nor I could ever get our heads around this kind of an idea of this sprawling motorway. But of course, where Texas would differ from Night City, for example, and from maybe the Japanese city being emulated or the imagined Japanese city being emulated is that people have have space right i suppose and, and night city seems to have this motif it does have this motif of like urban decay right yeah. that society is kind of falling apart i mean so as you're saying i'm thinking of my work on you know baseball history and stuff where the baseball field is this oasis of pastoralism within this decayed urban kind of center could you talk a bit more about you know uh where why do we have this assumption or or, or or why is that playing out even in this video game here in the year 2021 that people are living in these apartments cheek to jowl and people are physically sick and they're committing crimes and they're you know perhaps morally decayed depending on how you feel about the advertising and everything else i mean how much of this is maybe like a fear of industrialization or um a more kind of a moralistic thing or or uh, am I talking about different strands that need to be talked about considered as a whole there? I mean, I think that's a great question. I don't think there's any simple answer <laughs> to that. But one, I, I guess I, I could think of a few kind of threads. I mean, first of all, I mean, you know, what I was talking about a second ago about the the, the fear of urbanization. And in the United States, I mean, that is a very palpable thing. You know the so the flight to the to the suburbs you know white flight that many sociologists and political scientists study uh is it's this combination of a bunch of things but it the it's against uh, away from the declining inner city uh of w uh, with density no grass and greenery but also that's dominated by black people Right, it, it's very much a racist uh, escape from places where black people are in the majority, and abandoning cities in the in the United States. It's, I mean, it really is an American phenomenon: the the abandonment of the inner, the high density inner city, and the sort of uh, what's the word. Uh, vilification the the kind of creating a mythology of decline that's about the city that's high density and escaping mm -hmm. to a suburb that's green and where everybody's got a lawn but is that's also white right that that right. is con you know not contributing tax dollars in a sort of metropolitan region to the inner city where it's just thrown away on people who don't look like you and building infrastructure for them like transit right like i mean right that split in the in american politics is still very powerful and you know trump played on that again and again mm -hmm. demonizing the inner cities saying that the murder rate in chicago and all that kind of stuff right but it's partly that <laughs> you know but the weird thing in this is that it's overlaid with this sort of Japanese corporation that is the the big bad uh, faceless corporate controller that you're instructed to, I guess, break into or something like that. And yeah, they're effectively kind of the the the, the plot revolves around that particular corporation, and you're kind of a the antagonist of that corporation famously Keanu Reeves is in this game or his likeness and his voice are in the game and his character is this very kind of um 
perhaps some could argue cliched, um, you know, anti-corporate voice um, and, and the target of his anti-corporate ire. You know, I think of for me when I was in college, an anti-G8 type kind of movement, uh, only more almost arguably terroristic. Uh, the target of his ire is this Japanese corporation. And they're the most successful corporation. And, and the lines between governmental and corporate power, um, including military action, are, are very blurred in this fiction. Right. So I think that actually plays to, I mean, it's the fear of the other, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's so it's legitimate to do whatever you need to do to attack that corporation slash government because they're not legitimate. They're sort of in, an invader from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And which, you know, if it's an American corporation, General Motors or Apple, it has, I mean, it's harder to whip up that kind of, uh, sense of self-righteousness of t attacking them and tearing them down because you're right. right. So I think it, it, it has a lot to do with that. I mean, and that's similar to the, the, you know, targeting the inner city, the high density, old, dark place as the bad thing, because most of the American population is no longer in the inner city. They're living in suburbs. Right. That are actually, you know, not as decrepit as the inner city. Uh, so, I mean, it's 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 about the other and the, right. you know, if you're being incited to violence, essentially, and criminal, what I guess would be a criminal activity, you know, attacking mm -hmm. a corporation, it's easier to do if it's somebody else. Like, you know, if you're playing in a war game or in a real war and your enemy are uh, subhuman um ruthless unscrupulous people who will kill all of their prisoners then you it's okay to do whatever you want to them right right so partly about that <laughs> and i think it's interesting for me especially as someone who uh, knows very little about kind of the city like as an object of research in that sense but certainly as an historian i think to you know the 1970s united states and this kind of supposed jimmy carter malaise right and new york city is held up as like is this a failed city which you know to the new york city of our students right now for example is unrecognizable to them you know the, for brooklyn and you can talk about gentrification of course but the brooklyn of today is nothing to the the harlem and the brooklyn and the other districts in the 1970s arguably and at the same time japan is under going or has undergone what was sometimes called its quote unquote economic miracle, right? Where Japan has gone from defeated wartime enemy to probably the most advanced society in the planet in terms of consumer technology and things like that. And so there's this interesting for me, um, you know, uh, um, dichotomy of a perceived decline in American cities, inner cities, as you say, while Japan becomes the face. It's a scary face in the sense that people are buying Toyotas and not Chevys, right? Um, but also that Tokyo and in the cyberpunk genres, the public imagination becomes this is the future. And there it's just it's almost like an alien experience to ours. Um, I mean, if, maybe you could talk a bit about um, you know, why why does this idea of a Japanese or maybe a little bit more broadly an East Asian mega city why is that the future, you know? Yeah, I mean, again, that's a great <laughs> question. I think, I mean, it has, well, the urban future has always been such a contested uh, visual. You know, I mean, a lot of architects and planners uh, or, and, and of course, fiction writers yeah. and filmmakers have, have pro projected visions of, of a dystopian urban futures. Uh, and the, the fact that this one would be uh, an Asian one, I think it, well, I mean, it, concretely, it obviously has roots in a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One is, you know, cyberpunk, the, the, the title kind of gives it all away. It was William Gibson, Neuromancer, right. that set of novels about this dystopian urban future, which is it's set in America, but in heaps, it's post-apocalyptic heaps of rubble. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. big corporations running everything. Uh, but then, you know, that gets picked up in Blade Runner. And I, and clearly the, the visuals are, bore, you know, that set mm -hmm. the tone. It was soon after Gibson's publishing uh, those novels. So, so there's that link. So cyberpunk is about, you know, sort of the, the, the decaying American city that's dominated by Japanese corporations. Right. But then... The manga influences must has to be 
important. You know, the ghost, mm -hmm. they produce so much visuals. Right. In the manga culture, which is really amazingly well entrenched as a, 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 a set of stories amongst, I don't know about Europe, but in North American mm -hmm. teenagers and 20 somethings really know the manga world. Mm -hmm. It, uh, almost as well as young Japanese people, right? Yeah, it, it's it's all pervasive. You know, Ghost in the Shell and those those visuals uh, are are clear. You can see them in in Night City. I mean, that that kind of portrayal of the 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 city, and I think it 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 also. I mean, it picks up on. So there's those obvious things, but it's also Asian East Asian culture, particularly Japanese culture as being exotic mm -hmm. and inscrutable and kind of impossible to understand <laughs> you know for, for the average westerner it's just something that's so i mean it has it's obviously an advanced civilization when europeans really it well you know for most of the age of the colonization you know uh mm -hmm. from the 1600s japan was sealed off from the world Mm -hmm. So therefore, it was a hidden place nobody could get to. Mm -hmm. And then it opens up in the middle of the 19th century, and it's an advanced country, clearly. I mean, and then quickly, you know, by uh, defeats China in the 1890s and defeats Russia in 1904-05, in the first big defeat of a Western power by uh, a, an Asian country with advanced well, British technology, actually British right. warships. The, the the British government made an alliance uh, and because to, to, to ally with Japan and sold them the warships. But uh, that was shocking for the Europeans. Uh, and so Japan has had this special place of having, being evidently civil, civilized, mm -hmm. able to make war on the West and win <laughs> as a definition <laughs> of civilization, mm -hmm. but also um incomprehensible in, in in terms of the language the writing the um the uh, japanese people are often portrayed as being able to completely mask whatever they're thinking you know you can't yes. tell what they're thinking yes. in movies there's that trope japanese women as being incredibly seductive but also submissive and you know mm -hmm. uh it, it, it's 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 a lot of mythologizing about this place that is kind of exotic and incomprehensible. So yeah, I think that plays well in things like cyberpunk. Yeah, <laughs> you've got this mysterious place where you're given free reign to do whatever you want because it's not you. Is your is your your yeah? Right, and I you know in in, in the game then, and we I suppose I should say you know. The designers, I think, are the writers have gone for a deliberate kind of blending, almost kind of a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it, it, this is almost, you know, this is what um, further integration of our of different social groups. If if things go wrong, there's kind of almost a negative side to it, which is kind of can be sometimes alarming. But they're kind of, I think, they're going for this mishmash. They're you know a designed cultural mishmash but at the same time i think it's interesting for us because as you say like even me playing it i'm getting these memories and uh, of living in east asian cities and the funny thing is you know i lived in taipei in taiwan for a few years and i lived in a particularly dense urban uh, i lived in in what is now part of the city of taipei Zhonghe, a very 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 dense uh, residential area um but it was it, it was the opposite of the game, which I know is dealing in kind of stereotypes. Like it was very clean place, um, and there were lots of things to do, and there were lots of things for children to do, and there were lots of places to eat. It was just, you know, urban density in this case by no means um, had. In fact, they were years ahead of the West in things like recycling, um, and and things like this. So I think we have this this difference for you and me in particular between what a Japanese city would be as reproduced in this game versus this imagined version. Of kind of what the what the city would be. I think that's such an important point that it, it actually, although you know, some of this architecture and flyovers and multi-level expressways and super high density you could find in Japanese cities, it's actually it's not a very 
good depiction of Japanese urbanism, which as you say, I mean, or, and I've, I've uh, stayed in Taipei as well. It, actually, Taipei is, is kind of, it, it's, it's, a, it's a nicer version of Tokyo than Tokyo actually is. Oh, wow. <laughs> Taipei people would love to hear that. Taipei <laughs> actually still has this kind of smaller scale to it that is actually works really well. Uh, right. Taipei is a really livable city, I think. Yeah, yeah. But, but actually, so is Tokyo. See, that's the weird thing. Tokyo, as you say, it has this in extraordinary densities. But it's actually very livable. It's a very comfortable place to, to, to stay and live, uh, partly because the transportation system is so amazing, right? I mean, you know, you can get anywhere very comfortably and reliably on the subways and trains and stuff like that. But also because it's clean, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also because people are super polite, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They're, they're really, really always in failingly polite and, you know, you get greeted with a smile whenever you buy something in a convenience store, which of course is, you know, it's, it's not that meaningful because they're, they're, they're instructed to do that. But it's, you know, you come back to North America and go to a store and you're kind of disappointed at the level of service <laughs> or the, 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 the delays on the subway yeah. or the garbage in the street, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Because Tokyo is so clean and actually kind of the opposite of what is depicted in that film, except for the high densities. So right. I, it, it yeah, it's not a very accurate depiction uh, of a Japanese city of in, in so in 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 the I guess I guess kind of thinking of how you can lay different skins over mm -hmm. video or gaming experience. You can say, okay, I want this to look gray or right. I want it to look cheerful <laughs> right. and sunny, right? Like they've put the gray filter on everything and it's yeah. drizzling and raining and stuff. And I, so, I think oh sorry, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, well, I think that's actually, that's an excellent point. Um, uh, the game even includes a kind of a visual filter that some people have turned off because they don't like it, which is kind of giving this almost like VHS kind of 80s fuzz uh, to the graphics. Um, and I think, you know, people watching and listening might kind of be, you know, yelling at me, hey, you know, you know, the, the, this is a dystopia and things have gone wrong and there was a nuclear past and everything. And as you say, yeah, we know that, um, and we know they're not trying to produce, you know, a good version of a future Japanese or a future Oceana city, whatever we want to call it. But it's just intriguing that in in having made the decision as writers and as developers to, you know, this is going to be a negative or flawed, or it's going to be a, an experience that feels difficult. You know, there's a character early in the game, and he's driven entirely by a desire to break out of this very real underworld you know um there's there's a big there's an attempt at a class a classist discussion in the game and um, which also has roots in cyberpunk but for me as i was playing it um that just it feels so rooted into this negative urban experience and so i just think that's intriguing you know to see what they what they have glommed onto in some cases on purpose and in some cases maybe subconsciously a little bit you know yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. I mean, yeah, given they're trying to portray a post-apocalyptic crime-ridden dystopia, but then how you choose to portray that is then your choice, right? Right. Uh, and I mean, it's just, it, it's so, it's very, um, uh, I was gonna say, uh, unsurprising. Yeah, it, it's, it's entirely unsurprising that the choice for that dystopian environment would be the high density, gritty, mm -hmm. Japanese-esque city, right? Because that's such a long tradition. I mean, it really goes way back to the 19th century and experience of the, the city of dreadful night, right? Of, mm -hmm. of Peter Hall, right? That, that, um, that the so early social reformers were so afraid of the city as a corrupting influence and as as lethal actually people went to big cities to die london in the 19th century imported so many people who died young uh and so it was a place of disease and death and misery and overcrowding and that has colored 
yeah. particularly Western ideas of what's a good place to live and what's a bad place to live ever since. And it really gets exaggerated out of beyond all proportion in the United States where the city is not a good place to live unless you're in Manhattan, right? <laughs> or, right. Uh, may, I guess maybe San Francisco. Yeah. Um, but all the other cities are, are actually decaying, crumbling inner cities uh, that are populated primarily my, my minorities. Mm -hmm. And the good place is the suburbs where you've got greenery and big houses and new infrastructure and shopping malls and, Schools. and all the rest. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the city is a place to in, in American mythology as a place to escape from, you know, for the last 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and oddly, I mean, the, the, there's been a move back towards cities in the last 10 or 15 years where, you know, urban sustainability ideas, New York being heralded as the most sustainable city in the United States because the average consumption of energy is so much lower than anywhere in suburbia because people don't drive cars. It's, it's not convenient to have a car and it's so super expensive to have a parking space <laughs> and there, there is a subway, you know, so right. that, 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 um, you know, move to back towards the city now is being really uh, challenged in during the pandemic, you know, people are moving out of cities again to escape disease. So there's 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 this. I think it's a it's a it's an important um, theme of American culture in particular, which gets spread to the rest of the world in important right. ways, of fear of cities as as a as a a, a dangerous environment uh, and as a dystopian place, and that the suburbs are the solution. So I mean, in the game, what's it? I think it's 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 predictable that it would be the city. Because actually portraying the suburbs as a dark, grimy, difficult place is actually quite kind of hard, right? I mean, it's right. Like, there's too many trees, yeah. too many lawns. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know. I, I did a lot of work on urban sprawl. And I can tell you, photo, making a photographic representation of urban sprawl is really tough. You know, it just, it, it doesn't look like anything. You know, it, it just looks like a few houses and some fields. I mean, it, it's actually really hard to make a visual representation of, of you know, catastrophic urban sprawl. Right. Whereas catastrophic density is actually quite photogenic. And, huh. and <laughs> so anyway, I mean, this That's kind fascinating. of a minor point. Well, it's but interesting because other games... Oh, on sorry, this go line. ahead. One more thing on this line, which is maybe a, a, an aside bringing it back to Japan is it's interesting in the 1970s when there was that period of American urban collapse re represented by the, the, the bankruptcy of N New York and the collapse of cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh and that sort of stuff, which it really was a bad moment for American cities. The Japanese were very afraid that, um, that their cities would become like the crumbling inner city in the United right. States. And there's a, quite an interesting literature, academic literature and policy literature about avoiding the donut, the, 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 you know, the empty inner city. Right. And it was linked in quite a bit of the, the literature to immigrants. At that time, there was a lot of it. This is 1980s, you know, mm -hmm talking about the decade before, which is always the lag in social sciences, <laughs> but they, they had a lot of immigration from Iran. Mm -hmm. And so there was our Iranian ethnic enclave starting to appear in Japanese cities. And that was seen as, you know, the potential slippery slope to uh, decline and abandonment of the inner city in Japan. And they actually started to make policies to encourage the building of housing and and that's sort of this beginning of the high-rise residential boom in central cities is they really you know they were depopulating mostly because not because of abandonment as in the united states but because of the expansion of big office blocks right, right in, in the boom of the 1980s but it meant that the 
the inner city areas were being depopulated. Uh, their neighborhoods were getting cleared for office buildings. Mm -hmm. And that was seen as potentially the tipping point that would lead to that kind of a dystopian, crime-ridden, uh, immigrant populations inner city like the United States. So the, the, the American urbanism is used, I think, throughout the world as a kind of um, of a warning, you know, as, as a kind of a, uh, this is our future unless we act to, to avoid it. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. fascinating. And you because you're then you're left with these issues. They're so difficult to you, you can't it's difficult to reverse uh, uh, to some extent, as you say, it's, it's almost kind of happening a little bit now, perhaps with the children of the people who went to the suburbs, the grandchildren of those who went to the suburbs. But it's difficult to reverse the dynamic. I also think it's interesting you point out because, you know, there are games and, of course, many um, lots of fiction. You know, when you when you try to depict the suburbs, you go for this subversive Stepford wife type uh, take. I think that's kind of the take to kind of attack the suburbs with. And of course, cyber, they've made the decision they're that's just not compatible with what they want to do. They want this kind of, you know, city focused idea, which I think is fascinating. Uh, another thing I want to ask you about as well, there's also, and I, I've had this myself in my own life, especially when I was younger, the, the, the monopoly that a specific vision of Tokyo in particular has on the Western or non-Japanese mindset of what Japan is. So, you know, when I, years ago now, when I was getting my master's in Chinese studies and I made friends with a gentleman who, he had done the Japan, Japan English teaching program. Um, which for if anyone's watching or listening is interested, you, if you're in college, you should 100% consider doing this after you graduate. And most of those uh, young people end up in the countryside or in sm quote unquote smaller cities or whatever. And he had he actually, you know, fell in love and he lived out. I forget where he lived, but he lived out in effectively a small town for three years. And that was just alien to me because I think this either this Tokyo or this this manufactured Tokyo in the cyberpunk mold, it kind of obliterates you know, the rest of Japan. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Is that is that something, I mean, do you see that in, in the game? Like, are we kind of falling into like a one note perception of what a Japanese city looks like? Or am I barking up the wrong tree? Is it more a sense of the aspects of the city that we're focusing on rather than one city versus another? That's, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, there's so many <laughs> ways to answer <laughs> I'm that. sorry, I like asking very difficult questions. I should have yeah, warned you. <laughs> uh, Okay, well, I mean, a few things come to mind. One is, I mean, that, you know, Osaka looks very similar in many ways, although mm -hmm. it has been losing population for much longer than Tokyo. But, you know, Tokyo really is the, the city that swallowed Japan in some ways. I mean, young people move from the rest of Japan to Tokyo, uh, and the rest of Japan has resented Tokyo for that for a long time. You know, this is really starting in the 1950s with the rapid economic growth period. People, and it wasn't just to Tokyo, it was also to Osaka and Nagoya. But, you know, the the, the Pacific Belt, the Tokaido megalopolis mm -hmm. region was where all the jobs were. I mean, it really, and the government made major efforts to distribute investment elsewhere in the Japanese archipelago, but really the, the movement, the depopulation of everywhere but Tokaido is a major theme of the last 60, 70 years in Japan. So mm -hmm. um, it's partly for that reason that Tokyo looms so large in the imagination it's now a third of the population, the Tokyo, the Kanto region around Tokyo. Um, but also it's, it's, it's the center of the economy. Uh, mm -hmm. That's of course why pop people keep on moving there. Young people <laughs> move there for opportunities and of the educational system, you know, the, the most prestigious universities are there. So people, young people go there for those reasons. Uh, so Tokyo really is a dominant influence mm -hmm. in Japan. Uh, and and many, uh, and of many Westerners' uh, experience of Japan, you know, Tokyo is mm -hmm. is kind of the emblematic center of Japan, um, and maybe Kyoto uh, as the traditional cultural iconic place with the temples and the, right. the smaller scale streets and and the Japanese gardens, and and of course, I mean, one thing that's really unrealistic about 
the depiction of Japan, of course, it's not Japan, it's a sort of pseudo Japanese city in the in the in the game is that the it's 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 selectivity, right? And I, I've always intrigued, you know, before I first went to Japan in the 1990s, my image of Japan was from the, the, the National Geographic type photo essays that are portray Japan as as essentially as the temples and the mountains and the cherry blossoms and the Japanese gardens, right? Mm -hmm. This and when you go there to actually take a picture that looks like that to reproduce your kind of mental image of what Japan is supposed to look like, you actually have to use your you know camera very carefully to crop out the <laughs> giant hydroelectrical power to tower uh, transmission towers and the factory chimneys. And then you can have this perfect view of Mount Fuji right? Right. <laughs> with the cherry blossoms and the park in the foreground. So you're all, I mean, that I think is, you know, the, the, the game does that very, you know, it centers just on the gritty inner city right? and ignores most of Japan, which is actually, you know, it's 70% forests and mountains. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> it is mostly rural, even yeah. if that's the declining part of Japan with le depopulating. Yeah. And, and that's probably where you've actually got crumbling infrastructure and buildings. The inner cities are, are actually very well maintained, still get a lot of investment in new buildings and uh, street sweeping and uh, upscale restaurants and stuff and, and uh, high powered new cars. It's the rural yeah. area where you can find the decline and and actually abandoned buildings and, and empty places. Right, well, I suppose the concentration of people brings with it a certain amount of political heft or uh, influence in the, uh, over decision makers, I assume. Like, or there's, and you Tokyo, know... Tokyo has also always been resented by the rest of the country for the political heft. Uh, right. Uh, and uh i mean people have complained for 50 years about having to go to tokyo as supplicants for mm -hmm. investment and infrastructure money and government pork barrel handouts <laughs> uh, and um, i suppose in the game this is interesting you use such an interesting phrase a moment ago of kind of the city being seen to swallow up the you know the rest of the you know the country in this case almost and there's there's fictional reasons i suppose night city would do that but by also transferring what political power there is in the game um over to corporations who are effectively doing what they want to do that's their attempt and people watching who've played the game will know that the game i think had mixed results in this but that's their attempt i think uh to to craft this into like a socioeconomic debate or a kind of a a, a, a class conflict type debate and i suppose you could say that um if the corporate interest is divorced from the welfare of the people in the city, I suppose. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that comes back to what I was talking about before about legitimizing uh, actions that would normally be seen as simply criminal. And I mean, I think I think it's actually it, it, it's a it's a problem as, problematic aspect of first person shooter games, you know, Grand Theft Auto and stuff like that is that it's deep, it's, it's, it, it, I think it's a kind of a necessary function is to, uh, to delegitimize the wh whoever's running the place uh, <laughs> and make them the criminal. A lot of American film is like that, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you've got a cartoon characters, uh, it's very black and white. You've got super evil dudes uh, who the, the the good guys, it doesn't really, there's no holds barred because mm -hmm. they're fighting super evil and therefore you can do whatever you want to them. Many thanks to our guest, Professor Andre Sorensen from the University of Toronto. And thank you for watching History Respond. You can find more information about us at historyrespond.com. And if you'd like to support our work, please consider visiting patreon.com slash history respond. See you next time.